in a state of, you know, you need to hypnotise yourself so you can't be interrupted. And that was just unsustainable. But, you know, it was an interesting concept. Uh, and I think that got me thinking about maybe I should do the real thing and, and look into that later on. But I, I know I hadn't given up on all these methods yet. So I actually also tried, <laughs> while we're going through it all, um, going to see my GP and um, she put me on a, a drug to help you boost your metabolism and lose weight. Um, I, I don't remember the name and I, I won't mention it anyway, but that actually made me go a bit crazy. I actually felt like I was, I don't know, just on adrenaline all the time. And that made me feel sick. So it wasn't worth the potential benefits of yeah. that. So, yeah. You know, I think a lot of people have tried these sort of methods because you know, having surgery for weight loss is something that's often, you know, a last resort. Um, and so I, you know, I'm a classic case of trying everything first and then going down that method because I just wasn't doing what was working for me. Um, so after all this, you can change slides now. Mm -hmm. um, I was actually put on, yeah, a concoction of medications for my pain and depression because mm -hmm. uh, I, I honestly became depressed and, um, you know, I'm not ashamed of that. Um, it happens to the best of us. Nobody is immune to it and it happened to me. Um, and I was put on, I kid you not, a, a concoction of medications for depression and for pain, but then the side effects of the medications for the depression and for the pain um, needed to be treated as well. So I was put on more medications to treat the side effects of the initial medications. It was an absolute disaster. And I didn't know what was doing what. And I just started to swell up and I started to feel worse. I developed anxiety. Um, and you can see even in that picture that I'm in hospital now for my mental health, but you can see that my stomach's just bloated up. That's just swelling. Um, so, but I didn't know what was doing what. So, and I, I'm not kidding, I was on all those medications, not necessarily at the same time, but that was a clean out that I did. That was therapeutic for me. I did that last year. I went through all my cupboards and I just threw it all out. I just said, no. That's not helpful. Um, then so, there is something here yeah. that uh, I commend you for your transparency and for the courage that you have taken to share this with the whole audience, you know, and I really commend you for that. It must have taken a lot of effort to actually get over, uh, you know, but also the feeling of getting rid of all those medications, which were kind of literally drugging you. Yeah. And I try, I try the natural therapies too. Don't get me wrong. There's a lot of um, healthy methods that I used, you know, like some vitamins and minerals and, um, you know, things like that. So th those I didn't throw out <laughs> because I didn't feel they were doing much damage as, as these were, you know, the pharmaceutical. But in saying that, it was just because I had so many issues going on at once because one thing led to another, which led to another, which is a cycle that a lot of women or people go through when they're trying to fix one thing and then it, it impacts on the other. You know, that, that we talk about mind, body and soul and how we have to have the three working in alignment to feel well. And if well, one there's a comment here uh, by one of the uh, uh, attendees is that there are a few supplements there uh, that are totally valid. The GABA, there's gabapentin and stuff like yes, but again, when you've got those pharmaceutical drugs in your system mm. that are really high powered, you know they can only do so much. You know that's how I feel. Because I, I just feel like I was all out of balance. And so with all these meds, one having a... And so that wasn't going to do much. Perhaps if that was all removed, then the natural alternatives could have played a bigger role, if that makes sense. Yeah. But I was pretty bad in a bad state. And this is the result. You know, yo-yo dieting um, ended up with very bad skin, um, very bad skin. Uh, the chronic pain got worse. Um swelling, like I mentioned before, I was exhausted and I ended up not being able to walk without pain. And I was walking, I had um, a walking, I've actually still got it. It's a, you know, one of those walking aids that the elderly usually use and to go shopping, I would use one of those mobility scooters at times because I could not walk further than maybe a hundred meters without needing to sit. So that's where I got. And, and this isn't a sob story. I mean, I mean, it is, but it's not, I don't, I'm not doing this to get any sympathy. What, if anything, I'm trying to show that 
anybody can go from being healthy and fit and go down a path. You just don't know what life's going to present, but you can turn it around, but you need the right information. You, you need the right tools. And, and Danny, sorry to interrupt you there. I can't hold myself. What you're sharing <laughs> is so powerful. I'm feeling moved, you know, looking at this. I am truly feeling moved because this is giving me a real insight of the people that I've been seeing for the last two decades, you know, and sometimes being a surgeon, you start looking at just the mechanical side of things. All right, this surgery, that surgery. But, you know, this is such a deep perspective. It is truly moving for me personally. And I'm sure Julie and Hannah share the same views. Mm. Thank, you. Thank you. I mean, the reason why I'm putting it out there is to share the story and to be transparent because I think a lot of people are feeling like, oh, well, you know, I'm a lost cause and I can't get better or whatever, but you can see that you can. Um, and, you know, although this is my situation, I have turned it around. And obviously, I've had the bariatric surgery, which has helped. It has, you know, catapulted my well-being in, in the right direction. But it hasn't been just that. And as you know, Dr. Aruna, when I came to see you, mm. I had all the gut health knowledge. You, you name it, I'd done the, the right research. I, you know, it's like when you learn all the wrong things, then you start to think, okay, well, maybe this is right. And so... I started to look at the integration of, you know, different aspects, which we're going to talk about a lot more um, in the following weeks with the with the dietitians as well. Um, but at the moment, we're talking about the myths and what can go wrong. That's why I wanted to show you that. And I think the worst thing was, um, you can go to the next slide if you'd mm -hmm. like, um, my relationship with food. I mean, it changed during that time. I went from just eating like, I didn't think much about food, you know, I'd eat for nutritional reasons, but I'd also have the occasional treat and stuff like that, but I could exercise and I just wasn't too phased about food. Um, and then all of a sudden I became obsessed with food in, in, in an unhealthy way because all these, all these diets was, had, had ruined my metabolism and the medications had done that as well. Um, but also I just didn't know anymore what I was supposed to eat, how I was supposed to eat, when I was supposed to eat. So I was just using food Whenever. Um, would you say that the diets had thoroughly confused you? Is that, is that what would summarize all that? Absolutely. I mean, when I first started dying, they, dieting, so they said, no, um, you know, you've got to get rid of fats. Like it's, you know, no fats. That's a no good. And then I realized, actually, no, that's not true. You know, but I did a high sugar in the end diet because I'd go for the low fat variety and that was high in sugar to give the taste. And, you mm. know, we now know that, and sugar is very inflammatory. You know, that's not going to help your chronic pain. So, you know, and then you're cutting out your carbs completely. You know, well, you need your complex carbohydrate. I mean, I've learned all that now, but I'm just saying that at the beginning, I was doing, oh, this is a new fad diet. Oh, you can drop six kilos and hold on, let me drop that quickly. I'll just take these shakes for a few weeks, you know? Just so, a question to the audience here. Like I know many of us, just a show of hands. We've got about 11 participants here. How many have actually tried at least three or more diets? I just want to gauge uh, that, uh, you know, three different kind of diets. And I've got a show of hands. Thank you everyone for being so transparent about it because I think uh, as Danny is saying, it really leads to confusion. Someone yes. says fats are good. Someone says fats are bad. And mm. someone says sugars are good. You are thoroughly confused. People are just on a protein diet. And I'm sure Hannah and Julie will talk further about it. Mm. So no, that's powerful, uh, Danny. Thank you so much for sharing this. Um, and there's always a happy ending. Um, <laughs> yes, there's a happy ending. I want to see that. I hate to let this, you are oh, seeing. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> there is a happier ending. Yes, yes, there is. There is. So I'll, I'll leave it at this, Danny, in the pictures there so that you can um, yeah. see, you know, where a lot very of us can end up. Very powerful. You know. Awesome. Okay. Now that's really amazing. Thank you, Danny. That is okay. so, so uh, motivating. I think it's so moving for so many of us. Uh, I will keep my presentation brief, and I think that truly sets the stage for whatever uh, you have just shared uh, with us, Danny. 
because I guess the bottom line is uh, that there are so many myths. And in fact, I would probably even go to the extent of saying that the medical profession need, takes some responsibility, needs to take responsibility for creating these myths in a way that we are perpetuating it. So I'm just going to be very quickly zipping through some of my slides because I don't want to deprive the audience from the wisdom of uh, Julie and Hannah because I think they will have more to say about it. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, Arundir is my name. We have met before. Uh, and I guess the bottom line is we are dieting and exercising. It's like a perpetual vicious cycle, which is one is feeding the other. And what is happening is that mm -hmm. our bodies are in a deprived state of consciousness, as we discussed last time. And most of us are feeling trapped. We feel we are kind of, you know, have to function in a certain parameter, it, like can't have this, can't have that. And exactly as you've shared, I'll skip this because calorie counting is not a great strat strategy. I've already shown this slide in the past, but what it is, is it's an extract from my book and the vicious dieting cycle creates a subconscious level of stress. <coughs> the body is then just going between famine response and feasting response. And that causes the stress hormones to be always heightened, causing our metabolism to get compromised. And whenever the stress hormones, cortisol especially, is high, it tells the body there is a threat out there. And whenever there is a threat, the body has to conserve energy because we don't know. We might need a sudden burst of energy to fight or to flight. And that is where the body gets into a energy conserving mode all the time. And that's where, as Danny was showing this, the yo-yo dieting is a perpetual rise in the weight. You know? Now this slide, friends, the reason I wanted to show you is the myth around diets is that cutting down your calories is actually going to help with weight loss. And I have always, always, always said that's a bad strategy. Focus on your metabolism. Because if you see this slide, this pie chart very clearly says that 70% uh, of your energy expenditure is your metabolism, which is the resting met metabolic rate. 20% is the physical activity and 10% is the thermogenic effect of the foods, which is basically the energy that is required to digest the food. So if you focus on your metabolism, how to boost your metabolism, and metabolism is determined significantly by your gut health or gut microbiome. This is what science is telling us. And by the way, this is not new science. This was practiced centuries ago. Like the Mediterraneans, our predecessors who would be making whole food plant-based diets basically, and that's what they would be having. And what surgery does, surgery does this most important thing is for those people for whom surgery is a kind of an indication, surgery shifts your metabolism relatively quickly. However, if you don't realize it, and if you're constantly into that circle of dieting and exercising, it leads the body again to exercise exhaustion and your metabolism goes back to where it was pre-surgery, which is why operations can fail as well. So I guess what I focus on, and I know Julie and Hannah share the same views, that we focus not on a diet as such, but predominantly whole food, plant-based diet. What that means is cutting back on your processed foods. Yes, you can add a bit of good quality pro, uh, protein by way of chicken, by way of fish, but only once or twice a week is my view. Again, I'm not on a mission to try and turn the world into a vegan or a vegetarian because that is not a good strategy. Vegan, well, I say sugar, potato chips, and beer is vegan. Okay, but the thing is that when people come and tell me that I'm vegan and I'm vegetarian, it doesn't mean anything because you could be taking a lot of sugars and still be feeling happy that you are a vegan. So keep that in mind. I oh, personally. Sorry, prefer... um, yes. Sorry, can I interrupt you on that? Just Please. with the food. Um, I'm just wondering whether with meat, because I know a lot of people are meat eaters, with whether grass fed meat is okay to add to, to that list there um, for the yeah. iron and, so, and whatever? 
Absolutely, Danny. Look, that's a question that we get asked quite often and uh, we can have a multitude of views, but let's take an unbiased view. Now that you've touched this topic, it, it, it is something which is very, I'm passionate about. The World Health Organization classes wheat, uh, classes meat, sorry. The mm -hmm. World Health Organization classes red meat, especially, and processed meat like sausages mm -hmm. as a class one carcinogen, which means it is carcinogenic because of the processing that it goes through. No wow. matter whether it is grass fed, the important thing to understand is that the heme, which is the red blood cells, the protein which is there in the red meat is heme iron, which is inherently carcinogenic. That means it causes cancer formation in the cells of the human body. Plus, you don't know about the amount of antibiotics they have been fed, the amount of hormones and those sort of things. I just feel that if we can reduce that intake into our body, we can, we can get iron from many other plant-based sources and it is very easily absorbed. So that's my view again, uh, but that's based on no religious beliefs. That is based on whatever I had learned and researched over the years. Plant-based protein, again, the benefits of that, as you can already see, but my message is only one. Have everything in balance. You've got to have all the macronutrients, which is the carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, but also the micronutrients, which comes uh, like vitamins and minerals and all of that, which I'm sure Julie and Hannah will guide you through both individually as well as in group setting as they've already been doing. But this is one last slide that I made that I wanted to share with you that why diets don't work. Now, this may sound very philosophical that I'm going to share with you, but you know what? That is a very, very big principle why diets don't work because they need these four elements of work and it stands for something. Number one is willingness. I am, as I said to you, that I am not a believer of going on a diet. I like a little bit of chocolate. I like a little bit of sweet, a little bit of, uh, you know, fat and all of that. But I guess I am more interested in willing to find out what is the source of it. Where can I get a good quality sugar? For example, I use dates. Date is or raw sugar or brown sugar is what is my preferred sugar. I don't like the taste of Splenda and other sugar-free alternatives. The second O is optimism. I can tell you many, many, many women that I talk to who have tried diets have got a subconscious level or a belief that it is not going to work in the long run. Danny, would you agree with me or not? Yes, they just have this fear that yes. I'm going to lose weight now, but I know this might come back. So that optimism is not there. You're not looking forward to being on a diet. Not hey, bad. how unexciting is that? You know, <laughs> there's no optimism. There's already you're starting from a state of pessimism. And I want to just see uh, just the audience. Uh, do you agree with me, guys? Whoever, all our attendees, do you agree? Just a show of hands that, yes, thank you. So, you know, you're already starting from a state of pessimism and then you become re reactive. You are not responsive. Responsive means that you have to understand and adapt to what your body is telling you rather than, oh, I'm upset right now to hell with the diet. You know, then it kind of defeats everything. And the last and the most important, which is the K, I call it kindred spirit or the community or the support that you get, because that is crucial. We all need that support. We are human beings. All this information that I'm telling you is available on YouTube and you search in Dr. Google. But I think when you hear a bunch of passionate people talking about things and sharing their journey, sharing their experience, it causes us to shift slowly but surely. And that's what I define by the work. Because I think when you don't put in that work, regardless of whatever program it is, it is not going to deliver the results that you're after. So I wanted to just thank you with that, uh, you know, last slide is I am giving, uh, uh, we are actually in the process of giving away some of my books uh, at a discounted price uh, on Amazon it is for 25, but anyone who's interested, they can just email Lisa in my office and we'd be very happy to send it to you guys. So thank you so much for listening to me. Uh, I am going to hand you over to our amazing, beautiful dietitians.
Julie and Hannah. And uh, who's, who's speaking first? Uh, is it Julie or Hannah? Julie? It's yeah, you? Both, yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll come thanks. Thanks, Arun. Um, I'm going and... to introduce myself and uh, Danny just. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So, I mean, as I've already heard tonight from Danny's story and, and uh, you know, everyone's speaking now, I mean, diets are just exhausting, right? You know, the, the hard work, we get confused, we feel out of control at the end of it all. Um, and it's, it's just a lot of hard work. So it's, it's definitely not that, you know, some people come to us and they say, oh, I feel, feel lazy because I can't lose the weight or anything like that. It's like, no, you've definitely tried a lot of different avenues um, and it can just be exhausting. And the reason it's like that is that, you know, as again, as I've seen from some of Danny's slides there, is that the market is just overwhelmed with all of these sort of quick fixes or this or that. And so it does just become a little bit overwhelming and, and we just don't really know the, the right path to go down. So thanks for having us along. As Arun said, Hannah and I work in the field of weight management. Um, so we see a lot of patients who are either going through weight loss surgery or um, also people who just want to lose weight without surgery as well. Um, and so what we thought we'd talk about tonight is just to sort of cut through a bit of that noise and to have a chat about some of the myths that are out there in the dieting world. Um, so we can kind of set the story straight a little bit. Um, and then later on in, in I think a couple of weeks, we might come back again and just have a bit of a chat about some longer term strategies that you might find useful um, in your journey to a sort of a healthier, happier you. So I'll hand it over to Hannah now and she'll start off with a few. Yeah. Um, and then and I'll pick up again. Over there, Julie, um, before Hannah starts, if the audience has got any questions, just type it up. I'm the moderator. I'm going to keep putting it to both Hannah and Julie. So feel free, let the questions come so that the, the discussion is stimulating and also informative for everyone. Thank you. Uh, I think we just might need to be able to share the screen around so I can put yeah. up a presentation that we yeah. have. Uh, do you, can you do that? Can you do uh, it? It says that it's disabled, my screen sharing. Your screen sharing is disabled. Okay. I'm not sure if you have a setting there, maybe. Mm. Allow me to share. Change role attendee. No, no, make co host. Okay. Julie, are you able to share your presentation? No, mine's disabled as well. Because okay. you are. just try that now, Hannah, because like yeah, can, there you are. Can everyone see that? Beautiful, yes, I can. Excellent, let me just get that up on a full screen. Alrighty. So, dieting myth number one, and Danny, you already spoke about this beautifully, <laughs> it all links in really nicely, but Weight loss is about willpower, not biology. That is one of the most common myths out there, I would have to say. So if I had a dollar for every client who told me that they couldn't maintain their weight loss or keep it off because they don't have the willpower, I'd be really rich. <laughs> it's really well documented in the, in the literature, though, that the vast majority of people who lose weight end up regaining all the weight they lost and more, unfortunately. And a lack of willpower is, is not often not the reason. Um, you may be able to sustain the, the diet long term. You may be the best dieter ever, um, but it's our bodies that, that really aren't able to set, sustain this you know, constant state of calorie deficit. Um, and that's really from an evolutionary point of view. Um, our bodies simply aren't wired to sustain weight loss long term. It's not in there. It's not in our best interest. There is no survival advantage to um, being a lighter weight or not ca carrying around excess energy. Um, so, in, you know, our bodies are essentially genetically and biologically programmed to keep our weight within a set range. So this is called the set point theory, and, and this image on the left with the blow up beach ball below the surface of the water. If you think of that, um, like the effort of dieting, so a bit like dieting, you know, you're constantly trying to force your weight below the surface, a bit like a ball under, underneath water, it's taking lots of effort, it's hard, it's difficult. Um, you're using every, every bit of energy you have to, to force that weight down. But um, the moment you take your foot off the accelerator or you stop putting in that effort, so to speak, or you try and resume um, a slightly higher calorie intake, um, the, the weight or the ball, so to speak, bounces straight back up to, to where it started. 
Um, and that's really a representation of what happens behind the scenes biologically. Our body will lower its metabolism in the sense that it gets a lot more efficient at using the energy that uh, you're feeding it. Um, so that's one way that it will try and work against us. Um, we lose a bit of muscle mass as well, so that, so that can certainly um, mean that, you know, our body is not burning as much energy. And also we know that all of the hormones that are involved in actually um, driving our appetite and directing us to feel full and satisfied actually change. So um, there's been studies to show that even a year after dieting has finished or, you know, someone's gone off a diet, the hormones that are involved in appetite, so namely increasing your appetite to drive you to eat, still remain elevated. So that really sort of explains, I guess, why despite some people, you know, often coming in and saying, I'm eating exactly the same things, I haven't changed my diet, um, but, but their weight just continues to increase no matter what they do. So um, hopefully that kind of busts that myth for you. And I guess on the topic of bariatric surgery, um, we know that that really is the most effective way to basically reset or reprogram your body set points. So um, yeah, that, that's myth number one. Myth number two, kind of similar. Weight loss diets work in the long term. Danny has very eloqu eloquently told us exactly why they don't work. So I think that's a really beautiful summary. And often all of those points you made, Danny, get um, overlooked or aren't really discussed very often in a healthcare setting um, or you know, even through the mediums whether we consume information, um, you know, magazines and YouTube and all that kind of stuff, you know, it's often over overlooked the psychological um, shortcomings of dieting. So um, there's, you know, a really strong body of evidence to show that there's really clear linkages between um, dieting and the development of disordered eating habits. Um, and in actual fact, you know, the very reason we want to go on a diet to lose weight can <laughs> result in the complete opposite happening. Um, and that's weight gain, but even more often the establishment of quite a negative relationship with food. And, and Danny, you said that yourself, you were never really preoccupied with food until you hopped on a diet. Exactly. And that's because the experience of dieting or the process of dieting um, sort of trains us to ignore our body's hunger signals. So instead of trusting your body to alert you when it's hungry and when to stop, we eat based on rules or, um, you know, everything other than, than our body, really. We start to eat with our mind, if you, if you think of it like that. Hannah, so just, a comment, that uh, just a comment, and I'm sure you guys have observed it as well in your own practices, that, you know, even though these uh, characteristics of you know poor relationship with food it may have its roots in the early teenage years for girls especially we know this because they get obsessed around you know body image and all that at that age onwards but somehow it has been my observation that it tends to manifest when they have had the second kid or the third kid and that's when the body weight starts to kind of you know blow up any any thoughts around that like uh, uh, or any, any comments around, uh, you know, why do you think it manifests that late? Of course, our meta metabolism is evolving. I know it's a bit of a curly one, uh, but I thought in case you had any thoughts around it, like as it happened with Danny, as we noticed that she was really pretty trim around her wedding time. But I think it's after the second pregnancy that things started to shift. In my case, yes. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say in my case, it was immobility, you know, that sort of spiraled it out a little bit. But also, I don't think women have time to look after themselves or do the self-care um, that they might have been able to do prior to having children because all of a sudden, you're not in that important anymore. I mean, you are, but you haven't got time to think about it. So well, I don't know. Clean. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, I agree. And I think our observations are, you know, whether it's pregnancy or a difficult life event, um, they can both manifest in the same way. And that can often be, you know, use of food to be serving an emotional need. And often that is what starts that sort of cycle of wanting to hop on a diet because, 
you know, that process or, or that development of that coping mechanism that involves food and particularly high calorie foods leads to weight gain naturally. And what do we want to do when we want to lose weight? We go on a diet. So I think for, for many people, whether it's pregnancy or a marriage breakdown um, or, or a trauma of some sort, that can certainly start that dieting cycle for many people. Um, and I think it, yeah, it comes down to how food is used um, as more of an emotional crutch as opposed to, um, you know, nourishment physically. That's so true. That's so true. Um, yeah. So look on the topic of dieting as, as we sort of were touching on, it leads to that swinging of either deprivation or overindulgence or that all or nothing thinking or mindset that we often talk about as, as dietitians. There's um, often no in between. So thoughts of food might become all consuming, which is exactly what, what Danny said, you know, because that innate trust in our ability to kind of regulate what we need and what we feel like gets put in the hands of, of a diet or someone telling us what we should do. And inevitably, when we, we break these rules, we feel really guilty. Um, we feel shame. We feel like a failure. We become dissatisfied um, with, it, with our body. So, you know, I think Danny mentioned as well, we're far less likely to look after ourselves and eat well and start doing things that are good for us when we're not feeling great about ourselves. So we, we punish ourselves by restricting as much as we can and, and so goes on that cycle. Mm. Um, so... You know, obviously, the, the answer is not not trying to lose weight because that's certainly you know why a lot of our clients are here today. But but taking the emphasis off weight or dieting, so to speak, um, is is you know we see a, a lot, much more achievable and, and realistic approach to um, achieving a happy weight and ultimately a healthier relationship with food. Um, which, which then improves self-esteem and self-confidence um, and just enjoyment of life, you know, to not always be focusing on your weight and your food the whole time, frees up that space to actually participate in life and, and enjoy things. So, um, yeah, that's, that's really myth number two. And I think Julie's going to talk a little bit more now about the weight loss trajectory, so the process itself of losing weight and calories. So if anyone has any questions at all um, or any of their own comments or experiences that they would like to share based on any of those points, please feel free to. Otherwise, I'll hand I've over. I've got to one comment that I can read is, uh, you know, for others, uh, is that one of the attendees has commented that, you know, it's also, and, and I totally agree with this, that growing up as kids, it's a generational thing that mm -hmm. our parents and grandparents would say, finish everything on the plate before you get anything else or before you get to do anything. And that has been ingrained into our brains. It's been wired in that you have to finish. No, you cannot waste food. And yes, I understand that that was coming culturally that A, you got to respect food, which I get it. Number two, uh, you cannot waste food because it's a precious commodity. I get that too. But I would say that, you know, start with a small serve first, you know, that's an option too. But, you know, I guess uh, it was all loading up your plate. So I guess anything you have to say about that, Hannah and Julie and Danny as well? Yeah, like you say, I think a lot of, um, like you said, the behavioral stuff is quite subconscious, isn't it? It's sort of under under the surface and it can definitely come from, from childhood. So it's sort of processing all that and, and working on that and, and recognizing it too, isn't it? That's really Absolutely. important. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, Good. I'd agree. Excellent. All right. All right. Well, I'll continue on with the um, next myth of the yeah. fact that all calories are equal. Um, and everyone actually sort of touched on this in his presentation as well. So, um, you know, I'm probably guessing here that when we think of dieting or weight loss, probably we often think about calorie counting, or that's one of the first things that comes to our head. And Probably, if I could see the show of hands, which I can't miss, but surely um, there's probably the majority of people in here that would have maybe tried some form of a calorie counting diet in the past. Am I right? Yes, we've got a few participants raising hands, quite a few. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's, there's, I guess I can kind of see the merit behind it, that we do, in a way, have to be, um, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, we do have to mm. be a little bit mindful of sort of our overall calorie intake, but that doesn't mean it sets the whole picture. Um, and it doesn't mean that we need to go through and count the calories of every single food that we have in our diet. 
Um, and that's because it's really about the quality of the food, not the calories in the food themselves. So let's sort of take a step back and have a think about what a calorie actually is. So basically it's the energy that that food is giving you. Um, and you know, you probably have heard of that it's a very simplified equation that if you take less energy in, so less food in, if that sort of equals the amount of energy out, then you won't gain any weight. Or if you take too much energy in then and not enough out, then that's when you will gain weight. Um, and so that's why we kind of generally think, oh, well, the lower the calorie the food, then the better it's going to be for me, right? The, help, the more it's going to sort of help me to lose weight. Um, but that's wrong because that equation is way too oversimplified. And as we sort of saw before, our bodies are a lot more complex than that. It's not as sort of easy as energy in equals energy out because different foods interact with our bodies in different ways. Um, so, you know, different foods... For a sec, sorry, yeah, I've sure. got a question here. Um, what do you think about intuitive eating principles versus restricting calories, which is what we're talking about for weight loss, maintenance, long-term? And I think that's what you're touching on now about, you know, eating what you feel is right versus what, what calories you're supposed to be having and consuming. Yeah, absolutely. So for the intuitive stuff, yeah, absolutely. There's a lot more sustainable long-term really when you think about it, isn't it? Because it doesn't have those sort of same rules and restrictions that are really difficult to stick to. You know, if you're, if you're trying to, as soon as you tell yourself, I can't have something, what do you want? You want to go and do it, right? Whereas if you're thinking, okay, I'm going to listen to my body and, you know, am I hungry? Am I full? What do I feel like today? I feel like that's sort of a, a lot more um, fluid and it's sort of a lot more sort of sustainable longer term. Have you noticed that when you've, is this something you've tried before, Danny, or the intuitive kind of stuff, obviously? Well, to be honest with you, since, since yeah. all these, these diets and so forth, yes. Um, now I actually listen to my body. I, do, I wasn't listening at all to my body because I, I don't even know what my body was trying to say <laughs> because like you were explaining and Hannah said it beautifully, like, you know, just your metabolism's all over the place. You, all of a sudden you, you're trying to force yourself to do something that's unnatural, you know, and so you're not reading your body properly. And, and so now definitely I can say that if I'm hungry, I can tell and I will, it's mindfully eating again you know and i'll eat but you know and if i can add to that i recollect the words the exact words from one of our past patients uh dr palmera de banks is her name the word that she used that uh, she had been a dieter as well long time dieter being a medical doctor herself and she said i felt a release a sense of freedom I could do anything I wanted to do, you know, which is like, wow, that's like as if you've been trapped all through exactly as I showed in my slide that as if you are trapped in a jar and, you know, you can only do this much and you feel so restricted, you know, so uh, I can relate to that, Julie. Absolutely. I think one of the biggest barriers that I find for people who recognize that their approach isn't working and that dieting is only sending them much further away from what they want to achieve is um, the moment you say intuitive eating and trusting your body, the first thought that comes into people's mind is I'm going to be out of control and my weight is, is just going to keep soaring. Mm. So I think logically a lot of people accept and, and acknowledge that that's a really great potential strategy for them to explore, to help them find some peace with food and their body and their weight. But there's, there's that Fear that comes into it um, again because it's so ingrained you know we've, we've kind of programmed ourselves not to trust our body because it keeps failing us um, mm. with every diet that we try that, yeah. that's a fantastic point and I think for me it changed because the surgery kicked in um, to be absolutely honest because I was trying to mindfully eat before that but struggling because everything was out of calibration and, and just removing those hunger hormones, which the surgery can do for you, um, reducing the size in my case of the stomach, you know, it, it gave me a great, it's like a reset. And then all of a sudden my body was, the hormones had sort of calmed down and I was able to go, oh, okay, I'm not actually that hungry at the moment. That's great. Otherwise, before I was just like starving, ravishing hungry, I didn't know whether it was emotional hunger or what it was. So I think that that sort of works with it, in, in my case anyway. Mm. And I think you're, you're right, absolutely. Whenever you're going to try a new technique, 
it's always going to take a, a long time to or a bit of time to sort of get used to that new technique isn't it so yeah uh, okay, um, I'm sort of trying to get, got to get my train of thought back here. Um, so yeah, look, different foods interact with our body in different ways. So um, as everyone was saying, you know, obviously the whole foods, um, quality, quality proteins, vegetables, fruits, all those sorts of things, um, actually go through different pathways in our bodies as opposed to more sort of artificial additives, um, refined sugars and those sorts of things. So it's really, the bottom line here is it's really about the quality, not um, the quality of a calorie, not just the calorie itself. Um, and, you know, often, as, as Danny said, you know, you sort of go for some of these diet foods and things that where the, the whole aim of that diet food is to reduce the, the calorie content of it. But they've chucked a whole lot of other things in there that are highly processed. So, A, they're not that great for your body. But, B, you sort of, you're left feeling quite dissatisfied after you eat them, really, aren't you? Because you're thinking, oh, I'm eating this diet food. Oh, I'll have another one. I'll have another one. Oh, well, I'm now going to go to my other food that I wanted anyway. So sometimes that's a, sort of a, a vicious cycle as well. Um, so bottom line is definitely it's about the quality. So you don't need to worry about calorie counting anymore. So I can give you the, the green light to go on that one. Um, next slide, Hannah, if that's all right. <laughs> And just the last myth we thought we'd talk about tonight, but you know, if there's any other myths that you do want us to discuss, definitely let us know and we can um, maybe bring them up in future sessions is the idea that um, losing weight is going to be this nice sort of linear process. Um, how many of you have sort of started dieting and it's going along quite nicely and then all of a sudden it hits a plateau or God forbid, you know, you've, you've weighed from one day to the next and it's gone up 500 grams or a kilogram. And then that sort of does send you into the spiral of sort of thinking, oh my gosh, what have I done? I've failed the diet again. What's the point? I'm going to give up, you know, and it's, it's quite a negative sort of head spin to, to go into. That happens to men too, by the way, just to yeah. clarify. Yeah. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason that we think this is that we're sort of sold this false, false reality that, weight loss is supposed to come down nice and, and linear, when in reality, actually, our weight fluctuates a lot. Um, and Hannah's already talked about the whole set point thing, and that's definitely one reason why uh, we see a fluctuation or sometimes a, a halt in our weight loss. But there's other reasons as well. So, you know, fluid balance shifts, um, particularly around you know, your women's menstrual, menstrual cycles and things like that, you might find that you weigh a little bit heavier than what you usually would. Um, with how hydrated you are is going to change, you know, your weight, um, whether you've gone for a bowel motion or not, you know, lots of different things like that are going to fluctuate, you know, are going to cause fluctuations in your weight. Um, so sort of what I'd suggest here is often, you know, when people are on a diet or when they're looking to lose weight, they like to weigh themselves daily. Um, so that can kind of be okay, I guess, if you're one of those people that can look at those fluctuations in quite an objective way and go, you know what, that is just a fluctuation, it's fine. Um, but I would say most people are going to look at that pretty subjectively and get pretty emotionally attached to that. So it can be a lot easier just to look at the overall picture and maybe just weigh yourself sort of every, you know, once a week or once every second week. So you're not going to see all that noise or those fluctuations in between. So it's not going to have the same sort of, um, I guess, head spin that it does when you have to cope with all that sort of stuff in between as well. So Basically, the main point here is it's the overall trend that we want to look at, not those fluctuations in the middle, because they are quite normal, but we just, I guess we don't really need to see them for our own self, if that makes sense. Julie, just a question here. Uh, what is your feeling about, uh, and I would ask this to the audience as well, in terms of setting target weights, you know, like I, I'll give you an example. I had a lady yesterday or day before I was consulting with her, she is 12 months now post gastric sleeve and she has done amazingly well. Like her diabetes is gone. She's in her mid forties and, and she looks stunning. Her blood pressure is back to normal. All of that, you know, we all expect that uh, if, if everything is going okay, but I guess she's not satisfied that she has not reached a target weight that she had set for herself in her mind at the beginning you know, in the start. Now, what do you say to those people, you know, and she is like, BMI is normal, no excess weight, zero, zilch. So what I'd say to that is what does that target weight actually represent? So why, you know, what's, what's the reason why she wants to get there or why you want to get to the specific target weight? Is it that you thought at that weight you could do a certain activity or 
fit into certain clothes or something like that. Because I think all of those sort of, once you can drill it down into that in a little bit more detail, all of that sort of those non-scale victories or non-scale reasons why you want to get to that weight, then you might find that you're actually ticking all those boxes anyway without actually getting to there. So often we, we put a number on it, but it's actually all these other things that that represents, which is probably a lot more important than, as you say, the, the, the actual figure, because you might actually already be there anyway. Yeah, and I, I say to that, that you know, you're not just a number on the scale. That's not just your identity. You're much more than that. And your body is such a huge, uh, intelligent machine, like medical science doesn't even understand it fully as yet. Mm. We are still in the process of comprehending it. So uh, absolutely, you know, and I'd like to ask the participants, like how many of you guys, just a show of hands had set up, or those of you who have had surgery, how many of you have set a target weight for yourself? Like, I will only be happy if I get to this weight. Is there anyone uh, of that? Yep, okay. I, I am seeing a f show of hands here, which is fair enough. Like, it's good to have a target. But I think, as Julie said, it's the trend which is most important. And I think that is what should be, uh, you know, the main driving force for us to continue to do what we're doing. I think we've got a fantastic question here, and I often ask myself this as well, um, from Patricia, talking about target weight. Why is um, BMI so important? Whenever I diet and start progressing um, to what my ideal weight is according to my BMI, I actually look sick and awful. And I can relate to that um, because my target weight, well, what I was told I should be at is about three or four kilos less than I am now. And I actually think I'm at my target weight. For me, I feel comfortable. I'm starting to see, you know, my chest, you know, the, and I'm thinking, I don't think I need to get to what uh, apparently my BMI or target weight that I've been told. So that's an interesting question because, you know, everyone's got different bone structure, don't they? Muscle, you know, everyone has a different sort of structure. I don't know if that one size fits all. I'm not sure. So I think over to you guys for that one. So that's a good question, I think, Patricia. I'll let you go first, Julie. Yeah, sure. Um, look, I would say, look, it's, it's one measure that we've got out there. It's definitely not the only thing that we should be considering. Um, and particularly as a health practitioner, you would, I would never use that single-heartedly. So, and it's, it's, it's one measure and it's definitely not 100% accurate as well, as you've said, there's lots of different variables that come into it. So you really need to assess uh, I guess the story or the um, the background of somebody before you just go and sort of chuck on what that weight should be from a BMI perspective. So, yeah, look, per personally, I wouldn't place as much emphasis on it as 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 maybe is written out there sometimes. And and I'd say most people working in the weight management field probably wouldn't place a huge emphasis just on BMI and getting to that you know target BMI. Am I, would you agree, Arun? Yeah, just to give a bit of a perspective, the history of BMI has been that BMI was originally devised by the life insurance companies. Uh -huh. Now, you know life insurance companies, they are very good at taking premiums from you, but they are very stingy in giving payouts. <laughs> so, no, this is real history. Yeah, this, this is, is fascinating. Yeah, BMI. yeah the, you need to know this because then you know that, okay, why am I using this only as a rough measure? So they set the standard so high that, and BMI has been extensively researched. So it's already ingrained in the scientific literature. Okay, what is the BMI? There are other things that are used as well, like waist hip ratio. That is also a very good measure, but not an absolute measure. So the, in answer to Patricia's question, I would say BMI may be important. It is better than just weight alone because weight alone doesn't tell you anything. If you are a short person and if you are like, you know, in a higher weight category, that's more detrimental for you than if you are a taller person, as we all know. So BMI is not absolute and you don't have to be at your ideal BMI. There is no such thing as an ideal, it's a range. But even then, as Danny has already witnessed and many of our patients have witnessed, I and I say this, that please, you are not a number on the scale. You are not, you got to be at your happy weight where you feel happy about yourself. Now, I'm not saying happy in an ignorant way, because you could say that I'm happy at a BMI of 50, which is not really happy. So you've got to take objective feedback as well. So it's a combination of a few things. So hopefully that, that answers Patricia's question. 
Yeah, that's fantastic. Actually, it's, it's fascinating to know about where the BMI came from with the yeah, issue. Yeah, yeah. I think that's and that's probably very accurate. Actually, yeah, that makes sense. Thanks for Good. that. All right. Well, I guess, uh, guys, we are on the R actually, and it's been a really amazing R. Uh, we've got one more slide. Sorry, Julie, I didn't mean to rush through. Oh, that's okay. Just a quick one, um, obviously, yeah. about picking fair uh, spotting a fair diet. Mm. Um, but I think it's probably been mainly discussed today anyway. Um, you know, obviously, if it sounds too good to be true, then it probably definitely is. Um, so, and also, you know, if there's any kind of magic cure or magic potion or magic combination of foods, I guess you just want to have a think about maybe who, who's actually making this claim, um, has it been studied and are they trying to sell you any particular product, which can often be the case out there. Um, any diet that really severely restricts your, your food intake of a number of different food groups um, and causes a whole lot of restrictions in that regard um, often tends to be a bit more of a fad diet and anything that has too many rigid rules and, and has a heavy focus on weight loss as well can be one just to possibly watch out for also. Yeah. Fantastic. Awesome. Awesome. That, that's, I think that's been rich content. Any, any questions from the audience? I would uh, uh, invite anyone who, um, uh, I'm going to stop participant sharing. Is that okay? Uh, Julie, was that your last slide? Uh, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yep. So uh, I believe we have had a very extensive and a very engaging discussion, and I'm sure our audience will agree with that. Uh, Danny, do you want to say some parting remarks Absolutely. and what's coming up next week, just to yeah. give us a bit of an idea, please? For sure. Um, basically, <clears throat> sorry, next week we'll be speaking to a past uh, bariatric patient um she's only a few months out i believe three months uh, yeah three months and she's doing extremely well so it'd be really good not to talk about my story and to have somebody else's and um she'll be talking about a um, a tool that she uses to help keep her on track and um to be honest i haven't used this tool as extensively as i probably should have um so it'd be wonderful to hear how she's used it um in a way that's been really really helpful for her and her journey so far so that's happening next next week so do join us and for those of you who joined us last week i did have some homework for you and i'm wondering how that went oh um, that's a teacher yeah. you coming up now oh my god <laughs> no i'm just wondering because um i used to I generally hide under the desk when they would ask for the homework you know i was not a very good student. you were one of those students were you <laughs> oh okay um but I don't know if anyone wants to share, but uh, it was about, you know, noticing a trigger and what sort of automatic thought um, you had and the emotion attached and maybe making a, a better decision or a healthier decision for yourself. Um, and I hope one of the clients that I had last week doesn't mind me sharing this, but she had a victory in that she, she noticed her self-talk and that she wanted food and she was sort of going into the cupboard type thing and decided that instead she'd actually look at some comedy um, and she put on something funny. She actually downloaded like a comedy uh, sort of app. So she sees all these comedians and stuff like that. And I thought, well, that's, that's fantastic. I mean, because, you know, laughter is great medicine anyway. And so she was tackling a couple of things at once. Um, so, you know, that, that was a victory for her. And I think that's fantastic. So um, awesome. I don't know if anyone else has got anything there, but um, that, that was um, something worth looking into, I think, and to continue doing that. Um, yeah, and that's about it, really. I don't have anything else. I just uh, hope you enjoyed today and this evening. And thank you so much to the dietitians for that valuable advice. I wish I'd heard that years ago. You know, I oh, really do. Because <laughs> you might have, have heard that, I can tell you, Danny, but you wouldn't have listened to it, you know. And there's well, a difference in the two, you know. <laughs> that's so true, because I think you have to go through your experiences to realise, hang yeah. on. Yeah. That, they know what they're talking about, you know, and these diets really don't work. And I wouldn't have known that had I not done that, you know, but yeah, so it's great to have people that know. Awesome. Their and what I would encourage the audience is whoever is listening, please send us your questions and feedback because Julie and Hannah are going to come back again on week seven, I think week six or seven, one of those weeks, but we'll advertise that uh, so that we can ask them more pertinent questions and get more value out of this. 
Excellent. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Hannah, for sparing your evening with us. It's uh, amazing. And Danny, thank you so much for your authenticity, your transparency. It is always inspirational. And uh, I will look forward to uh, joining you guys again uh, next Thursday in an interview with Fenella, who is early post-surgery, but I think she's got some amazing tools to share. Fantastic. Beautiful. Thanks for having us. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Have a safe night. Thank you.